All right, you can be seated for just a moment. We're so glad you made it uh, to our outside service uh, for the 4th of July. Uh, Hey, God has the final word on all this, but I will say this just personally. I am so grateful. Really, the last couple hours, I've just been super grateful. We had people here beginning like 6 in the morning, uh, kind of making decisions and getting things set up. And we have an amazing team. So I just want to thank and clap for our teams that are a lot of them are not even in here right now. Some of them are outside cooking, uh, so I'm grateful for that. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm super grateful to live where I live. I hope that you are as well. Uh, it is truly a unique experience to, to live in a land of so much freedom and blessing as we have. And with that comes responsibility as well. But I am grateful for that. And I'm certainly grateful uh, that we unite in the name of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ has changed my life. Uh, my life was going one direction. I literally met Jesus Christ, and my life has gone an entirely different direction. I'm so grateful for these things. So welcome to our service today. It's a family worship service today, so you're going to hear kids in here today, and you should be grateful to hear their voices today because they're also going to help eat all the hot dogs at the end of the service. So uh, we're so grateful for our family ministry and that they can be with us today. Hope that you got a bulletin. Take this home with you. You'll see on the back the upcoming events. Uh, uh, This Thursday, we have a senior adult fellowship. We would love for you to be part of that. If you consider yourself to be over 50 and a senior adult, we also have a Sunday night on the lawn, uh, weather permitting, next Sunday night as well, uh, the 11th. We have a new mom's breakfast. We would love to get to know. We have so many new moms. Uh, We would love to get to know you by name and get to know your children's names as well. And then at the last week of this month, we have a camp for our uh, school-aged children called Art and Soul. And so we're so excited to be doing these things Uh, But today we have this one guarantee, and that is that God would be with us if we would gather together in his name, and we are together in his name to worship. So I'm going to pray, and I'm going to step aside, and we are going to enter into some worshipful time today. So would you pray with me? God, we're so grateful that you are so good to us. Uh, You're good to all, Uh, but we've experienced your goodness in a special way, and and we want to say back to you. We want to worship you. We want to thank you. We want to come before you and say, God, Lead our lives because you are good and you are God and we are here as your people gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. In his name we pray, amen. You can go ahead and stand to your feet as we worship together this morning. Stay. 
Land of sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus' name. Silent as he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned, bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown of thorns. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor. Purchase and redeem and reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over. Lord, we give you all the praise and all of the honor because you have done amazing things and you have set us free. 
free from death, free from sin, free from shame and guilt. You have set us free and we are free indeed. So Lord, we want to meet you here. So we ask you to speak to our hearts through your word and through your servant. Lord, we love you and we trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Amen. All right. Let's thank the worship team. They've been here. They, they, they were here pre-breakfast. Pre-breakfast. So, so we, uh, we're in a series trying to uh, go through the Bible. And, uh, and I love it when you bring your Bibles. In fact, I was trying to shake somebody's hand this morning. He has a Bible. He's like... I was like, hey, I, I, I love that. I love that you have your Bible, and I can't even shake your hand because you have your Bible. But we also have some brand new Bibles and hymnals in, in, the, in, the, in the rows, so we're glad to have those as well. Uh, and we kind of just trying to give an overview of the Bible this summer so that when you go off on a vacation, because you need a vacation. Can I get a second? Does anyone need an amen on that one? You need a vacation, right? But when you go off, you'll kind of know where we're at. We talked about how God made it all, how God set it up, how we blew it. And you can blame Adam and Eve, but you can also look in the mirror and realize that you and I have a, a part to play in that. And had you been in the garden, we'd have been in the same mess that we're in, right? You blew it, I blew it. And God begins to rescue the world by using just a simple family, an Abraham and Sarah family. He doesn't even have a family yet. But he makes a promise to them that he's going to somehow make it all right. It's a promise he made way back in the garden to Adam and Eve. He reiterates through this family and says, somehow through your family, I, God, am making it all right. It all fix it all. Just follow me, kind of agree with me, walk with me, all these things. Later is going to come law and, and more things to obey or things to pay attention to. And uh, last week was a little bit of a diversion as far as reading through the Bible because I talked about wisdom literature because I really wanted to talk about the kingdom today. I want to talk about God and politics today. Isn't, aren't, aren't those some of the things that, that we see every day, whatever news source you trust? Unless you don't trust any, and then you still, it's God and politics. So I want to talk about God's kingdom, politics, and leadership today, and I want to say happy 4th of July. I want to say that I am so happy to live where I get to live, and, and even when it rains on my parade literally today, I'm like, isn't this just the greatest place to live? Yes, it is, and so, so we're so grateful. You know, we had the, the Boy Scouts of America put all the flags out on our, on our, on our property. Th didn't you think those flags were spectacular? So thank you, Boy Scouts, right? So, so there are large portions of the Bible that we just refer to as the Bible history. Uh, of course, the Bible's always true, but this is more the not poetic, not prophetic, but just the history stuff, like you know, Judges and the First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and I'm going to do all of those books in the next 18 minutes. So just bear with me because it's going to happen. So, but it's basically a, a 500-year experiment in monarchy. You know, uh, across the pond they kind of laugh at us like we're in our our experiment with democracy because you know they're into a thousand years of monarchy across the pond. But but you know we're all in an experiment because it's, it's not how it's going to end up. Okay. In the end, it's going to end like this. Don't, don't get too scared. But it's going to end in a totalitarian regime where a good God rules over all and, and all we got to do is live in his kingdom. But for now, in the Bible, we're in a 500-year history of the monarchy and it's got a few highlights and a whole lot of lowlights. And in our democracy, we might say something like the same thing. We're grateful for the sacrifices that bring us to today where you can go and shop at Walmart to your heart's content. We can go through a pandemic and survive it, unlike lots of parts of the world. Not that they're any less good than we are, but we just live in a blessed place. We really do. And we live in a place of privilege so that we're able to go and try to help things on the other side of the world. And we need to help ourselves as well. So... All that to be said, there's two passages I really want to look closely at. They're both in the book of 1 Samuel. I'm saying it now so that you look, and you look at your table of contents, and that's, you, you don't lose any points for having to go to the table of contents. All right? It's all good. But you want to find 1 Samuel. You want to find uh, chapter 8 here in just a moment. Because what we find is uh, this, this, in the midst of, of, of po politics is this ongoing invasive thing that we call sin, self-centeredness. And, uh, and we're going to see it there, and then I want to bring it back to our days. But uh, I, I call it this, if, if you like to write phrases down, the ancient and insipid desire to be first 
to win, to dominate, which I'm sure belongs to nobody out here today, right? Until your favorite team is playing and all of a sudden you become a different animal, right? From the, because, you know, how could he not have seen that call, right? Kind of thing. So um, that's, that's how we do things. I mean, that was a foul. That's all I got to say. That was a foul, okay? She was fouled. But uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you didn't watch Baylor Lady Bears. But um, we had this desire to win, to be first, and, 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 and not all of it's bad, but a lot of it's bad. Uh, so let me, let me show you how I see that in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, beginning in verse 4. It says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together, came to Samuel at Ramah, and said to him... Now this is after 300 years of having a judge lead them, a powerful military deliverer. And they didn't find themselves any better than they had been before that. It says, Behold, you and your son, Samuel, you're, 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 you're old... Your sons don't walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. So they were looking around going, hey, all these other people have kings. So what we really need is a king. The problem's not us. The problem is we don't have the right kind of political leadership. We need a king. Verse 6. But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you but they have rejected me from being king over them. So if you've read the Old Testament, this is a big deal, where God says, Samuel, don't get your feelings hurt, man. You're just a dude. But what they're really doing by saying this is what they want, they're saying they don't really want me to lead them. They want a king, an earthly king, a guy who's got to put his pants on one leg at a time like everybody else. That's who they want to lead them. According to all the deeds they have done, verse 8, from the day I brought them out of Egypt to this very day, so God is doing... You know, 400 years of history in in his one half of a sentence. Forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So here's the sad truth for all of us. I mean, we can lump it on Israel all we want. Sometimes you read in the Bible and go, oh, those people were so selfish. Have you looked in the mirror recently, okay? Have you looked at how many Amazon boxes are in your recycling pile, right? And so and we, we've all, we have this stuff in us. No elbowing people when I say Amazon. Okay, we, the truth is that the Bible says none of us seek God. None of us are altogether right. None of us can get through this life without the absolute help and grace of God. None of us, none of us obey God. None of us love God on our own. Sometimes that's hard for us to hear because uh, many of us have come to know God personally and we have begun to love God until there's something that you really want. You go, God, I'll talk to you next week, but this is what I want to do right now. And then next week we come and repent. We go, oh, that was, that, was a, that was a mistake. That was a bad mistake. And God sees the end from the beginning. We all want what God has and we're, most of us are willing to do almost anything to get it. I thought if you wanted to do a great show on TV, here's the show. What would you do for $100,000? And I'm telling you, there is no, there's nothing most people wouldn't do for a little bit of money like $100,000, right? Uh, we would do almost anything. People get murdered for a whole lot less than that every day in our country. So the people are saying, we want a king, a symbol. And here's why they want a king. They say, a king will help us get what we want. Doesn't that sound American? We want to get what we want. We don't care who we need to vote for. We want to get what we want. When we talk politics in our country, it basically comes down to what do you want the most? That's who you're going to vote for. And you'll turn the blind eye to other things. And the problem is there's, there's nobody who can do it all. That's the, I hope you hear that. Nobody left, right, center, uh, blue, red, green. Nobody you can deliver. But we trick ourselves into thinking there might be. So in desiring this self-determination, we... Also, like Israel, reject God's leading in our lives. When we say, I'm going to get what I want, we are rejecting God's leadership in our lives. Because just like Adam and Eve and just like the people in Samuel's day, we don't trust God to give us what we really want. We don't trust God to give us the best. We think, kind of like Adam and Eve in the garden, when the snake says, You know, maybe God's just kind of holding back on you. The reason he doesn't want you to eat from that tree is there's something good there. Uh, I mean, you'll actually be like, you don't even need God. And they begin to believe that God is somehow holding back something good from them. So let me say it as clearly as I know how to say it to you today. A good God is not holding back anything good from you. There's nothing that a good God is holding back from you. 
Now, he may be saying, you're not ready for that, and you don't have to raise your hand. I'll raise my hand for all of us on this one. There are good things in our life that we have not been ready for yet. Had we gotten them back then, we'd have messed them up. Amen? Okay, I'm talking to some people here. I like it. God has your best interests in mind, and he's not holding back from you, but he's saying, follow me, trust me, and the issue is, will we be like Israel and like every person ever and say, eh, I think I'll just do my own thing, or will we begin to walk in a trust, an active trust in a God who is wiser than we are and who sees the end from the beginning and who knows the way we should go? The people in Samuel's day said, we want an earthly king. By the way, you read the rest of that book, God gives them exactly the kind of king they wanted. Come on up. It's good. And he's, he's fine. He's fine. And the, the king that, that they give him is a guy named Saul. And if you read the story, it's just one of those, that go, oh, not Saul, Saul, not Saul. So how does God do this? Because he's saying, hey, trust me, I've made a covenant, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to deliver, I'm going to rescue, I'm going to redeem, but we keep kind of giving God the stiff arm. How, does, how can God do that? And so if you're, if you're just in a good spot, maybe in the message right now, you might be thinking, you know, I kind of stiff arm God every once in a while. And that's a good place to be. Recognizing that we all do that is a good place to be. If you're, if you're out there going, man, I've never stiff-armed God in my life. I just need you to stop by after he have a hot dog and talk to me for a little bit because I'm trying to try to convince you that you're not nearly as great as you think you are, okay? That's one of those great jobs we get in ministry. We get to convince you of that. <laughs> if you're married, bring your spouse. It's so much easier when there's <laughs> like an eyewitness, you know, some kind of thing, so... But, but the question is a good question, like, how can God possibly, what we should get to is saying, God, there's no possible way for you to save us if you're using us. That is an amazing discovery if you can get there. God, there's no possible way for you to save me if I am involved in even the smallest way. Because God, at the end of the day, I'm very, 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 very selfish. And that is God's way. He's saying, I'm going to make a covenant but it's not a promise where, Wayne, you've got to do anything. I'm going to make a promise. I'm going to make a covenant. And I'm going to completely fulfill the covenant without your help. And God one day will step from heaven onto the planet. And he will suffer every indignity. He will suffer every injustice. He will suffer everything that humanity could do to say we reject you we hate you he will suffer it on the cross for the very people who made him suffer including us that that is the gospel but back into the old testament history how does god do it i mean you some of you you know that there's 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 moves and shakes that he does to get to this point so i want to skip now into first samuel chapter 16 and and again, it's just like a peeling an onion. It's just one more peel back that we begin to see there, a little bit more of the plan. Apparently, and I, somebody needs to hear this, apparently God is not in a hurry in your life. When you read the Bible, apparently God is not in a big hurry. He is doing things in his own time. And so like by five o'clock today may not be your answer. But even though God is not in a hurry, he is also not late in your life or in my life. So at just the right time, uh, you know, this king thing, had everyone in the kingdom goes like this. Oh, this is a terrible idea now that we have a king. This is not the right guy for us. What do we do? Because I don't know if you know this or not, but kings don't really like elections. They don't like to be voted out of office. That's not how it happens in a monarchy, okay? So Samuel is commanded by God to go and to anoint a different king. And this is how it happens in 1 Samuel chapter 16, I'm going to start in verse 6. It says, the, the, they came and he looked, that Samuel looked on Eliab, that's the oldest of Jesse's sons, because God had told Samuel, it's one of these sons of this guy. And Samuel thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed, because apparently he was good looking and strong and you know, he played middle linebacker. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. You want to underline that one in your Bible. 
If you're using a pew Bible, you can practice underlining right there in the pew Bible. We're good with that. Because this is such an important verse that you and I, we always look at the outside. Come, come to politics, we're looking at people. Come to beauty pageants, we're looking at people. Come to sports, we're looking at people. Come to entertainment, we're, we're looking, looking, looking at people. Because we look at the outside, that's all we can see. But God does not look at the outside. Most of us are not happy with our outsides. That's why there's, there's every kind of thing to change your outside, to change your diet, to change your body shape, to change everything about your outside. You can find it here, brother. And God says, I'm not looking at the outside because I can look straight to the heart and I know what kind of person you are, God says. And God had already chosen somebody that, beyond Samuel's uh, understanding. And this somebody was going to be a guy named David. And you know this name. And it's one more peel back of the onion of God doing it God's way. If you had a great prayer today, it might go something like this. God, I don't know how to fix our nation, but I pray that you do it your way. God, I've got my own ideas, but you don't need my ideas. God, do it your way. That would be a great prayer today. So God begins to do it his way, uh, and, and, and David is going to be called the great king, but even David is only a foreshadow of the one true king. In fact, it's said, it's promised to David much later on that, that God is so impressed with David's heart, which is not a perfect heart, he says that the, the, the one deliverer, the one redeemer, the one who has been promised from the beginning, that one will come from your line, David. It will, he, he will be an eternal king. And we know that that's in the flesh, uh, Jesus Christ, the lion of the tribe of Judah, David's very tribe. He's going to receive this thing. But, you know, if you read on through the, the, the history, which, which I strongly recommend that you do, you find that there are some good kings. There's a whole lot more bad kings. There's some decent people. There's a whole lot more indecent people. And if the, if the answer to our problems was political, believe me, somebody would have figured this out by now. But the answer to our problems are not political. And yet, this idea that God looks at our hearts, at the inside of who we are, is still super important. So almost every king and queen ends up being the most selfish person in the kingdom at that moment. And so God does what we're going to talk about next week. He begins to send these, this group of people to speak to the monarchy, and they're called prophets. And there's a huge part of the Bible called the prophets, the, the prophecy. And it's God's voice because the, the monarchy's not going to do it. Maybe God can have influence by using his servants to speak to the ones in leadership. But for now, for this 4th of July, I want to say these things. I want to say clearly how much I love our country, how much I love being a citizen, not just of our country, but even of our state. But I want to say this clearly, too. I don't always agree with what our country does. I can't imagine that everyone does. I think we're remarkable, but I think we also have a very mixed history. And our hist a mixed history means we've done some things incredibly right, and we've done some things incredibly wrong. That's our country. Because our country is made up of people like you and me and like David and, and all these other people who sometimes get it right and sometimes don't get it right. Don't get it right. We've done many things well, but we've messed up many things. I can love my country, but here's the caveat. I can love my country, but I cannot love my country more than I love God. That's a big difference. When we put the two things together, we get very confused because our country is something that we have seen and tasted and touched, and God is not. I can love my country, and I do love my country, but God's word is very clear that we should have no other God beside him. And as great as our country is, which I believe it's great, I think we're the greatest country. It's still nothing compared to a perfect God. So you can love your country, but just don't love your country first. The, the people that get into this, this kind of form of nationalism, like my country is the, the ultimate, get off base because it becomes what the Bible calls an idol to us. And what I'm trying to do in our church is to appreciate the place that we get to live, the beauty, the freedom, all of these things that were bought at a terrible price, but to do one other thing, and that is to live in this country knowing that this is not my final country. This is not your final country either. I'm going to turn you lastly to this uh, Jeremiah 29. The worship team might want to come back up here during this last part. But in Jeremiah 29, this is a different period of time, but the the people that voted for a king and that got a king 
later on are kicked out of the kingdom because their kingdom went under and, and now they've been displaced and they live in a different land, a, a land uh, called Babylon. And it's, it's to the, the people living in this land that God tells his prophet Jeremiah, I want you to write this letter to my people who are in exile, who messed up. And this is what I want them to hear. This is verse 4 in chapter 29. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So this is God's word to people who messed up. So if you've messed up today or before today, this is the word for us that have messed up. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your son. Give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. And then here's the underlying part. But seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. So at some level, even though I love where we live and, and, I, and I love our history, I'm still a foreigner here. You're still a foreigner here too. But to be privileged to live here means to build and to plant and to multiply and to pray for the city, pray for the country where we live. Why? Because when God blesses the city and blesses the country, he blesses us and we go out and we bless others. Seek God's favor for this place. So I'll say these things. We are seeking God's favor over the city of Waco. As, as you've heard this summer, you know, we're in active partnership with places like Mission Waco, places like Shepherd's Heart Food Pantry, places like CareNet, places like Sunshine Recovery House. We're in active partnerships with these things that God is doing in our city. Why? Because it's God's city, because it's God's country, because it's God's world. So I don't know how we're going to leave today, but I'll leave you with these thoughts that simply say this. If you're in Christ, you're citizens of a greater kingdom than a, a, a geographical country, no matter what your country is, no matter how proud you are of your country. And you should be proud of whatever your country is. And Texas is a state, not a country, but that's, that's a different issue for another day. But God is acting to redeem it all. And he is just as concerned for people who live on the other side of the world people who will never in their entire life experience the freedom that you and I have to come here and to worship and to eat hot dogs. They will never experience that. And God died for every single one of them because God's kingdom is grand in design and endless in scope. And his invitation is to all people to come and to stream to the city that God is building. So until we see that city, let us seek the welfare and pray God's blessing on the places that we get to live. Would you pray with me? God, we do pray for Waco, Texas, and we, we pray for our city, our state, our country. We pray for the people who make decisions, and we live with those decisions. We pray for all of that. But what we really pray, God, is the thing that we were taught to pray where we say, may your kingdom come. May your will be done here on the earth as it is perfectly done in heaven. Oh God, complete your promises, we pray, because we are your people through Christ, our Savior, in whose name we pray, amen. Let's stand as we sing together today. been held.